Consciousness and Object by Frederick J. E. Woodbridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Professor Thilly's article in a former number of this review, I take the following extract. Starting out with a naturalistic metaphysics, these philosophers naturally end with a naturalistic metaphysics. Consciousness is an epiphenomenon, inhering in the objects. The object figuring in a conscious perceptual situation differs from the object out of it in the possession of consciousness. The nervous system, in Woodbridge's view, connects the sensations in a relation of implication. Consciousness as a relation of implication appears as a kind of unnecessary adjunct. Why it appears, no one knows. The connections are not conditioned by its existence. Its existence is conditioned by them. Consciousness looks on. There is nothing else left for it to do. There are two propositions in this extract on which I wish to comment in the hope of making clear the sense in which they appear to me to be sound. They are, one, the object figuring in a conscious perceptual situation differs from the object out of it in the possession of consciousness and two consciousness looks on there is nothing else left for it to do one the first proposition appears to me to be self-evident if it means anything i suppose that the only assignable difference between an object and consciousness of it is consciousness the proposition means nothing if there is no difference to assign but if the proposition is intelligible if we do distinguish between an object and consciousness of it, it would seem that this distinction is what it purports to be. If so, it does not appear to be debatable whether the distinction in question is the distinction consciousness. We face rather a question of fact. Do we or do we not distinguish between an object and consciousness of it? If we do, we ought to be able to tell what the distinction is. If we do not, we ought not to discuss the question, in spite of our wonder that it should, nevertheless, be asked. For my own part, I do not doubt that we can and do distinguish an object from our consciousness of it. I am conscious of the words I am now writing, but my consciousness is something different from the written words. And as for the reader, I suppose that he is conscious of the printed page before him, and that he does not identify his consciousness with the printed page itself. What, then, I would ask is the difference between the printed page and his consciousness of it, if it is not the difference of his consciousness? Just what the difference is specifically, I have elsewhere tried to define. I may not have succeeded in stating accurately what the difference specifically is, but that is just now immaterial. At present, I am interested only in an attitude toward a question of fact. I am insisting that, for my part, I take it for granted that we make a certain distinction and that it is no other than just the distinction we make. The first proposition, thus understood, appears to me to be self-evident and not debatable. We may debate only the question whether we make the distinction. Taking it for granted that the only difference between an object and consciousness of it is the difference of consciousness, I should like to emphasize two considerations which have been important in my own study of the problem of consciousness. These considerations appear to me to be so obvious that I can do little more than state them. 1. The distinction between an object and consciousness can be defined only in a situation where that distinction exists. Of course, there may be many objects of which I am not conscious. The difference between them and my consciousness of them does not exist. Yet it would appear that the demand is often made of those who claim to distinguish between objects and our consciousness of them to define that distinction before they have discovered it. Of course, I may attempt to tell what objects are like when I am not conscious of them, but this attempt is not the same as that instituted in the interest of telling how they and my consciousness of them would differ if I had it. The former attempt may be impossible without the latter, but the two attempts are different. So I repeat, the distinction in question can be defined only where it exists, and not where it does not exist. 2. If now the distinction is defined, it is, as I have already said, just that distinction and no other. If I do distinguish between objects and consciousness, the objects are not the consciousness. Their characteristics, behavior, and laws, if they are distinguished from consciousness, are not consciousness. Furthermore, their characteristics, behavior, and laws are not determined by consciousness, except insofar as I discover them so to be determined. They are otherwise determined, insofar as I discover that to be the case. 
If, for instance, I discover that the reason why the color blind do not discriminate between certain colors is the structure of their eyes, footnote, it seems to me to be improper to say, as Professor Thilly and others do, of the color blind man who does not discriminate red, that his sensory content will be blue or yellow. It looks too much like saying that the sensory content of beings without eyes will be black, or of beings without ears will be silence. End footnote. And if I do not identify their eyes with their consciousness, I may not properly claim that the reason is their consciousness. If, in general, I discover that what objects are as distinguished from consciousness of them is due to certain features of their own, or to certain relations to one another, or, if you will, to the interaction between the real world and the organism, I ought not at the same time to conclude that it is due to consciousness what they are as distinguished from consciousness, that they are so distinguished. These points have been fundamental in my own studies. I am aware that it may be claimed that I am avoiding the real issue. For one may say, the issue is not whether objects as distinguished from consciousness are what they are so distinguished to be, but whether as so distinguished they can also exist apart from consciousness. This issue, as the discussions of it have shown, has led not only to different conclusions regarding it, but also to fundamentally different conceptions of the way it should be defined. To a reviewer of the discussion, it is apparent that the participants are arguing to cross purposes, that although they employ the same terms, they do not employ them with the same meanings, and that, as yet, they can form no common platform for the discussion. I do not discuss the issue here, but simply state that, as I understand it, it appears to be disposed of by the two considerations I have already emphasized. I may, however, comment on this statement. Objects, as distinguished from consciousness, do not exist apart from consciousness in the situation where the distinction between them and consciousness exists. A fish in the water, although different and distinguished from the water, does not at the same time exist out of the water so also with objects in consciousness, while in it, although they are different from it, they are not also out of it. There would appear to be nothing debatable here, but the situation constitutes a difficulty in some minds, because while a fish may leap out of the water and still be a fish, who can possibly follow in consciousness the disappearance of objects out of it? No one, apparently, unless it be some of the anti-intellectualists. For my own part, I do not attempt such a flight. I seek no other road to a knowledge of objects than that which my consciousness affords. But I am interested in knowing what the objects of which I am conscious are, what their history has been, and what I may reasonably expect from them. In pursuing this interest, I am led to conclude that my consciousness once began in a world composed of the very type of objects with their connections, behavior, and laws which I discover the objects of which I am conscious to be. I discover that my thinking is concerned with much that I cannot possibly call thinking. In our stock phrase, my ideas are woefully dependent on my experience, and my experience has had a history which I can trace back approximately to its birth. I find it therefore quite impossible to believe that whenever there are objects of the type I discover mine to be, there also is consciousness. Of course, if one defines an object, as always, of consciousness, there is no room for dispute. But if one does not so define it, if one defines it in terms of discovered characteristics, behavior, and laws, which are different from a discovered consciousness, I must believe that I live in a world where consciousness, so far as I can distinguish it, exists only now and then. Consequently, when I speak about that world apart from consciousness, I speak about the world I have discovered minus the consciousness I have discovered. As I said, I am not discussing the issue. I am rather trying to define it as I see it. Since we do talk about objects apart from consciousness, I have been interested in trying to find an intelligible basis for our conversation. I find it necessary first to distinguish consciousness from objects. Footnote. Professor Thilly says, to decide what consciousness adds to the status of the unperceived object, we must have some notion of what is meant by the unperceived object. But surely we must also have some notion of what is meant by consciousness. End footnote. Secondly, to define what that distinction is, and thirdly, to subtract the consciousness thus distinguished and defined. 
the result is the objects less the consciousness. Ah, but you are still conscious of them, the philosophy which stops here may cry. But the philosophy which goes on from here will ask, is your consciousness of them the reason why objects are as they are and behave as they do? To anyone who answers, he cannot tell, the reply may be made, when you need to name a reason why objects are as they are and behave as they do, do you name your consciousness? If one starts out with a naturalistic metaphysics, he will naturally, unless he falls by the way, end in a naturalistic metaphysics. 2. Consciousness looks on. There is nothing else left for it to do. This appears to be a conclusion from what I have said above and from what I have said elsewhere, but I should like to alter it because in its present form I cannot subscribe to it. I should say that consciousness does not look on, not because it does something else, but because there is nothing for consciousness to do. Unless in denying that it is potent, we refer it, after the manner of formal logicians, to the class non-potent, then we may say that consciousness belongs to the class of things that do nothing. Not because it is impotent, but because the do-nothing class contains other members besides the impotent, consciousness is to be found. This formal statement is worth notice, because from the assertion that consciousness does nothing, the conclusion is so frequently drawn that it must be, therefore, a passive spectator of objects, and from the assertion that it is not a phenomenon, epiphenomenon, an argument or refute a statement. It belongs to consciousness directly that, in other words, consciousness does nothing, is by no means new, but has been made again and again by many inquirers. It may be admitted that the claim is still in dispute, and so far, one who believes that consciousness does something may urge his belief as against a theory which claims the contrary. But I take it that the recent theories of consciousness which Professor Thilly has under review are not primarily significant for claiming that consciousness does nothing. They contribute to a better understanding of the nature of consciousness itself. They have recognized that the discovery that consciousness is not to be defined in terms of efficiency or a discovery which at once falsifies their analysis, but a discovery which should be followed up and which provokes further inquiry. And following up this inquiry, they have been led to conclude that one of the basal misconceptions in nearly all modern theories of consciousness has been the unanalyzed assumption that consciousness belongs to the class of existences of which efficiency is predicable. They have felt that so long as consciousness is assumed to be a thing which can interact with other things, that affects other things and is affected by them, that it would do something if it could, or could if it would, so long it remains a thing which analysis steadily pushes out of nature, and of which even the existence may be seriously questioned. They have all felt, however, that consciousness is something natural, that it is something of which it cannot be truthfully said that it is an unnecessary adjunct. They have tried not to let this conviction carry them back again into the habit of assuming that consciousness is a term among other terms, or a thing interacting with other things. They have tried to define it in terms of other categories than those which have led to confusion and an unconvincing philosophy. I am not claiming that they have as yet succeeded, but I do claim that their attempt is fundamental to any appreciation or criticism of their point of view. With others, I have held that consciousness is not a term, but a relation. I am aware that such a contention needs a good deal of clarification, but I am also aware that an attempt to work out a theory of sensation, perception, and thinking under the general supposition that consciousness is a relation is not greatly affected by criticisms directed at its details from the point of view that consciousness is a term. It would be quite sufficient to show that consciousness is a term and not a relation. It is not convincing to criticize what in a relational theory of consciousness is said about perception or about the relation between the organism and its environment as if, in that theory, consciousness were still functioning as a term. Consequently, 
to discover that consciousness has nothing to do under a theory which starts with that conviction as a datum is not to have seen that theory's end but only to have glimpsed its beginning to put the matter a little more concretely professor thilly appears to represent the theory as if it proceeds as follows consciousness is a by-product of the interaction between organism and environment therefore it is a harmless looker-on it does nothing it would have been more consonant with the spirit of the theory to have said consciousness does nothing but it is by virtue of the interaction between organism and environment that all we do is done how then must consciousness be construed if its natural place and significance are to be defined the attempt to answer that question has not led those who are making it to any suspicion that to be conscious is to be something wholly superfluous in this world it is leading them to discover in the fact that the conscious situation is mediated problems of vital interest and importance the efficiency which others impute to consciousness they discover to belong to the being who is conscious and they find no contradiction in affirming that there belongs to conscious beings an efficiency which unconscious beings do not possess it should be apparent i think that the particular problem with which professor thilly deals namely the relation of consciousness and object in sense perception will take on a different look when approached from the point of view of a relational theory of consciousness than it does when approached from the point of view of a term theory if these expressions term and relation are too objectionable or in this context too obscure it may be said that the inquiry in question will not appear the same to one who is looking for something which consciousness does and to another who convinced that it does nothing is asking what then is its nature in other words i should say as i suggested in the first part of this paper that the question what difference if any consciousness makes in objects is not a question to be asked today without first defining the conception of consciousness employed in the question if consciousness interacts with its objects i do not see how the question can be answered if consciousness is mediated the exhibition of the manner of this mediation disposes of the question at once the question is irrelevant i have written these comments not in answer to professor thilly's argument but with the desire of emphasizing two particular problems one what difference if any is there between consciousness and objects in terms of which consciousness may be defined and two since our life so manifestly appears to be an interaction between organism and environment and not an interaction between consciousness and objects how is consciousness to be construed as something mediated in that interaction these problems seem to me to be important not as reminiscent of the past of philosophy but as suggestive of its future end of consciousness and object by frederick j e woodbridge